Hey, it's the Chief Bonding with Board Games, and this is Ham Tag. Ham Tag, we're Ooh. back. Half this, as much, twice as good. Bam, that is what the acronym means, and this is going to be, it might be slightly different for each, top five board games, or top five games played during the pestilence. 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 It's not, there's no you. It's pestilence. No, no, no. Yes. <laughs> so, what did you have topic-wise? Are we... Are we in? Because yes. sometimes we'll have slight variations. Yeah, it was your, for me it was the pestilence didn't really hit home till March of pestilence. 2020. And so that's where I'm going. March 2020 to the present. Anything goes, you in theory could see five Euro games from me. Well, yeah. So, yeah, as if. But it's anything's <laughs> open. Got it. And mine was was five games that the best five games from the Pestilence period. Got it. And oh, I'm sorry. Mine were the games I tried for the first time since March of 2020. And they were, yeah, new to me games. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, mine are new to me, not just board games. There's some role-playing games in there as well. And um, why don't you kick right. us off with uh, your number five? All right. So my number five is actually the game itself is a little older than mm. that. But it is U.S. Civil War, GMT Games, Mark Simonich. The third edition came out in August of 2021. I had I had the uh, older edition, and the third edition just really kind of uh, got it for me. I mean, made it so that yeah, I need to do need to try this game. I've got if you you know even in the olden days of Hamtag, I mean, I've got a lot of grand strategic Civil War games, Blue and Gray for the people, Rebel Raiders, uh, probably a couple others. And this is another one. The thing I like about this one is a lot of the uh, basic games for the people really emphasizes the leadership. Uh, Stonewall Jackson with a little bit, you know, with, with just enough troops can win a battle against a huge Union force. Hmm. The other, some of the other games like uh, House Divided, or uh, the old Civil War games, I felt the the Civil War by Victory Games emphasized numbers of troops at the expense of you know how leaders work. This combines it in a, in a way I really enjoy. You know, leaders are important, number of troops are important, and it feels balanced. Uh, the thing. For the people, a lot of times, since it's based on strategic will, you know, if the Union gets Virginia, Tennessee, maybe something else, you know, they'll win the game on strategic war. Here, the Union has to take the Confederacy. They have to take 60 of the 100 uh, victory points scattered around the Confederacy. So you're going to have to take Atlanta. You're going to have to you know, take the Mississippi in order to get enough points. So that makes it feel like a different game. So this is my number five game that was new to me during the pestilence. Mm. My number five, Plains Indian Wars from GMT. So if you've played, I didn't scoot up far enough, if you've played the Birth of America series, that's Academy Games, Totally different designers, and I'm blanking right off the top Penisky. of my head. Thank you, John. Um, so it's that type of dice rolling system, but it's in the American West. The railroad is is expanding from both the East and the West. Cavalry, cavalry is coming in and trying to pacify and protect both rail workers and seize territory. You've got settlers coming through. Uh, then you've got uh, the... Southern Plains tribes and the Northern Plains tribes, and then you have the other, which are purple Native American tribes that were battling historically with the Northern and the Southern tribes. So, but if you know the Birth of America series, it's taking that idea of a mechanic with the dice rolling and the card playing with your historical information and just putting it into that railroad uh, 1870s uh, time frame. So, um, and uh, GMT, Plains Indian Wars. Is there a lot of uh, Native American culture in this? Because what I'm thinking, 
when I saw that, what I thought of was Geronimo, which takes in the shaman and all that stuff. So the cards do include like uh, Geronimo's got a card and what it will give you as I think you, that's where all the rules tweaking happens. So I think Geronimo okay. gets to have some extra troops come with him or he, okay. he doesn't retreat or there's something. I can't remember each of the cards, okay. but that's where the historical notes sitting bull. And so it triggers off little rules tweaking things based on the card play you're able to to do. Okay. Um, so, Plains Indian Wars, John Paninsky. Paninsky. Ah, my fifth game during the Pestilence. I had to get the pronunciation. There you get it. Okay. <laughs> my number five new game I discovered during the Pestilence was <laughs> Hold the Line, the American Civil War by Worthington Publishing. Um, it's, if you know Hold the Line, it's a very simple system with action points to activate units. Um, it's a, it has blocks in it, but they're not fog of war blocks. Worthington just loves their blocks. You know, it's just a cool looking piece. Um, high quality, you know, very high quality looking game, very shiny blocks. Um, they added something new if you're familiar with Hold the Line. Um, they added a morale factor to it. Different color units for represent green units, veteran units, and regular units. And there's like a color die to determine if they're going to retreat in the face of a melee or how well they rally. That is a blast. Um, what well, really got me on this, because the question everybody asks is, I already have Battle Cry, do I need this? And that was my question too. Yeah. Um, okay, a couple of things. What really got me hooked on this is the YouTube guy, the discriminating gamer, wears a little flat hat. Right. Yeah, he and his buddy were reviewing it. And I, I was looking at this as a potential trade. And um, his buddy said, when they got done playing it, they got ready to put it up and play something else. And he goes, why don't we play this again? And he said, it's very addicting. And when I played it, it was the same thing. You remember those old 80s uh, commercials about the chips, but you can't eat just one? Yeah. That's kind of how it is. You play, okay. you want to play it again. It's really fun. Now, the battle cry thing. Um, but, okay, when I got asked this about Tricorn versus the American Revolution, they're, they're the same scale, but Command and Colors was a lot more complex. So you get to battle cries, like, it's not complex. So if you look at them, you could say they're kind of competing. Some people don't like the cards in Command and Colors. I can't activate my left flank. If right. that's a problem, that solves it. Um, the fans of Battle Cry have created alternate rules that make it play more like Napoleonics. Not squares, obviously, but using more of that, including battle cards from Expansion 5. And I find that when I play Battle Cry now, I, I prefer to play it there at a more complex and so now they're separated out. You know, that has 30 scenarios, this has 12. That's the only thing I've been bugging Grant. Would you please make more scenarios and kickstart them? And I'm not the only one who's bugged him about it, so hopefully he's watching this. Um, so my answer to him, and playing both, I love the, in the American Revolution. I love the, tri, the Tricorn game and Hold the Line, both. They just love them both. That's the same way with this. They both placed very high last year in my top 100, and they were very close to each other. I don't remember which one is higher. So um, Hold on, you don't remember which one's higher? I mean, no. <laughs> I'm just messing Okay. Up. It wasn't like one is top 10, one is 80. They were both pretty close. Um, the only thing about it is it's the only game in my top five that's out of print. It kind of surprised me when I went to look it up last night. I went to Worthington's site, and it's out of print. Um, so I'll help you. Um, you can go to the Facebook Marketplace. There's three of them out there. Um, first come, first serve. Jeez. Um, there may not be three by the time you view this. No, I said, so I said Facebook. I was meant the BGG Marketplace. <laughs> Another thing is whether you, if you hate Facebook, just create an account and go to Facebook Marketplace, Consim Marketplace. That is, I mean, you can hate Facebook all you want. That's the greatest place to buy war games. I mean, people are selling. You get on there, ask for it. You'll get. You'll probably find people offer. Also, go to BGG, find the people who have it for trade. Write them, say, would you take money? So that's very, you know, because if you don't have a trade that works out, they'll usually take cash. So this can be had. You just got to work at it. But anyways. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be applied to any game? Yes. yes. Yeah. Any, any, this game here, if you can find somebody, you can buy it. Yeah. It may, may cost a million dollars. It is, if you're willing to pay. As long as you can afford it. Yeah. So. But I mean, no, that's, people so that's, don't think that, about that. That's but, good info. Yeah, people just don't think about going to people to trade and saying, would you take cash? That's how I've got a lot of games. Find old people school, that have, man, if school. you find anybody has a game rank low and they have it marked zone. It's got, a lot of times it available for Venmo? 
That's what yes, I want to no. know. Um, <laughs> another thing that may come up, Bug Grant, see if they'll put it back, if they'll do another Kickstarter for this. Maybe they'll make another edition um, with more scenarios. See, cool idea, Grant. Okay, anyways, um, so that is my number five. Woo! Hold the line, American Civil War. <laughs> uh, I'm a little surprised there isn't a black market out there for fan-developed scenarios. Yes. You know, um, the... Um, Hold the line, if, Frederick's if, War. If if there is, maybe somebody will tell us. Yes. <laughs> no, the Hold the Line, Frederick's War. There's a guy out there that created a ton of scenarios for, it. and this is game is set up to where you can make your own scenarios. Yeah. I'm just not a guy who likes to do that. Hmm, and yeah. I thought Ivan Bonad Bone Grant said, you know, you could use Battle Cry as a template. Hmm. Um, so, anyways. Um, yeah. So yeah. yeah, if there's somebody out there, and I keep looking, hoping that more people will do it. So. All right. All right. So number four, for me is All Bridges Burning, Red Revolt, and White Guard in Finland, 1917-1918. This is by GMT. The designer is VPJ Arponen, and it came out in 2020. Um, one of the reasons why this is uh, in my top five is because I played this one a lot as I got more into electronic gaming during the Pestilence. Uh, I had tried to get in before, but wasn't very successful. But since then, I've I've got with the right people and played the right games. And I've, I mean, done a couple dozen games, a couple dozen war games mm. on um, on Vassal, on Vassal, Tabletop Simulator. Steam has got, for instance, Twilight Struggle and Labyrinth, Yakata, any of those places. So... I played this one a lot. This is a coin game, one of the counterinsurgency games, volume 10 in the coin series. What makes this unique is instead of being four players, it's three players. Mm. It seems to play a little quicker because the way the three player in a four player coin game, you know, player A gets to do something, player B gets to do something, C and D are out for the round. Here, if you want, all three players can do something every turn. So Things happen. You you can choose to pass, but uh, you know it goes quicker because there are more things happening in a turn. Uh, the other thing that makes this unique is there are two phases to this one. You know, most of the coin games you're you're in the situation. There you are. In this one, you start before the military conflict really happens. So you're you're not even moving pieces around the board. You're es establishing your position, but the games can end and have ended during that starting phase. Hmm. If if you know one of the sides is more successful at getting set up, then at some point when there is enough activity, basically when there's enough pieces on the board, the conflict breaks out and you start getting Besides the Finnish Civil War, the Russians come in, come in to help one side. The Germans, even as they're losing World War I, are sending, sending people in to, to support. So, you know, it's, you've got two phases going on. The only problem I do have with it is it's kind of the problem I have with Cuba Libre, that the map isn't... The map doesn't allow for a lot of maneuver. A lot of the activity, a lot of the cities, which are the most important thing, are located in the southern part of the map. So the northern part of the map gets involved some, but not very much. So you end up, your focus is a little compressed. But it was my number four games. I played it a lot during the Pestilence, and it's All Bridges Burning by GMT, my number four. Very nice. Above and below. So this is uh, Red Raven, I think, but it's Ryan Lockhart and his wife and his family. They've um, created this game. He does the art, the design, a lot of the writing. So what this is, this is um, the Ryan's first game, I believe, at least with this type of art. It's the first one I ever bought from him. We had a couple of her as soon as folks were coming around and Woody and Claire came over and brought this and we played four player. 
My wife usually doesn't like a game that has storylines in it. So this is kind of an action selection. You'll have, you start the game with three people. You can train and get more people to help you do more things. A little bit of worker placement, but not quite worker placement because they also have skills. One can train, one can build, one is better at exploring. And those are the three things you'll do. The key is when you go and explore, and this is what Liz, my wife, loved when we did it. You go and explore, you get a little card for going into a cavern. There's a random roll that leads you to a little like uh, choose your own adventure type book where you read off whatever the scenario is. And within that scenario, you usually have one, two, well, two or three choices. And then it's based on how good of an explorer did you take? Two, three usually. And then you're rolling to see if they get X a number, number of lanterns. And then that will usually give you uh, status or some type of goods or money. And you're just moving through this. It's pretty tight. I think it's eight turns and it plays way better two player. If you're ever playing it, you huh. want to do it two player. Yeah, we didn't like it. It was okay on four. Two, it's just that there's no, not as, there's no downtime. It's popping. You're reading if it's not your turn, if they're exploring. And basically you're stuck with, not stuck with, you have like three, four actions maybe before that turns over. And then you reset some of the things and the cards and the people and you're on to the next turn. So this became something that it's literally set up on the table upstairs now. Um, my wife says, can't we just leave it? That's the biggest hindrance. It takes a while to get her set up. And what we found is I might come home from work. I get home a little bit later and she'd go set up, let's play. And we would just drop in and it takes about 40 minutes. So it's a nice quick game. And it led uh, me to get all of Ryan Lockhart's other games in the system because this is something she never liked before, but she really enjoys reading these short little explorations that are going on below ground. So it's above and below, I mean, above and below, near and far. Um, yeah, and then the other one that Yeah, the out. other one. And then he's got... Is this the first one? This is the first one. Okay. And then he's got the, there's an aisle bound, which um, some people didn't like. It's more exploratory of the islands. And then the one that he really hit it out of the park with, I'm now forgetting the name, but it's got like the monster coming down from above and they just kickstarted the second edition and, the, and uh, an expansion for it. And its story is even better. I'm blanking on the name. Is this a... Is there is there replayability there? Is this a legacy? Will the story be the same every time? Um, it's not. Um, and so the stories, the book, you can start to run into similar. Hey, we've read that one before, and the book's pretty good. Um, 800 different entries okay. probably. Okay. But because the discovery part going into the cavern, there's six choices there. You roll a six-sided die. There's about... 40 or 50 cards, each with six different options, and you roll... For the starting point, okay. Yes, and then that sends you to the book. Okay. And some of them will branch out, choose your own adventure. If you choose this, you're actually going to go read number 329. Okay. And so there's a little bit of that, but it's very light on that. Just okay. enough that my, my wife Liz right. enjoyed it. And we've this is basically the go-to. I'll suggest something, and she'll say, nope, above and below. Okay. So Ryan Locker, Red Raven Games. Okay, my number four game from the Pestilence is Command and Colors Tricorn Jacobite Rising. First of all, I thought the name was weird. <laughs> tricorn. They didn't wear tricorns then. So, I will explain that. <laughs> I thought you were talking about the Jacobite. No, no. It's it's Maybe it is a Jacobite. I, you know, I'll keep it up so you can see Okay. It. Sometimes I do it because it muffles my voice. Oh, I've got to make oh, sure I've got oh, a line, go of, line of sight. Okay. Um, tricorn is... A, they made another game called for the Tricorn the American Revolution. What Tricorn means is it's the compass version of Command and Colors. You know Command and Colors, cards, left, right, center, flanks, battle backs, all that stuff. What separates this, it's unique, I love it, is number one, um, you, the dice calculations. You know, one of the gripes on Ancients, I have one block, he rolls five dice, I have four blocks, he rolls five dice. People loved Napoleonics, that I lose dice as I lose units. I thought it was too severe. You get down to one block, he's fighting uphill against one block, he has zero dice because he loses one. Back. Yeah, it's a little too... This one gets it just right. Hmm. You roll a little less dice, but you get a bonus if you're at full full strength. Good order units, 
you know, it's, it's a little more complicated in its system, but I can just look at them and go, here's the number of dice you roll on. So the system is identical in both games. Um, also, the really big one is the rally feature. This game has two flags per dice. It means you're going to see a lot more retreating. If a unit ever retreats, they have to make a rally check. And there's a formula for how many dice you roll. Bonus for leaders, yeah. things like this. And if you do not roll a flag, that unit routes and leaves the field. The idea was in the American Revolution, you were more, more worried about units running off the field than you were about casualties, where Napoleonic's casualties was bigger. That is a blast because you get some seriously elite unit full strength and he's rolling like six dice each with a third of a chance of hitting a flag and you whiff. Ah, it really gets that, you know, fall, and fortunes of war thing going on and the last is that it has combat cards if you've seen napoleonic's expansion 5 to a lesser extent samurai and its dragon cards it has those except instead of napoleonic's having a common deck these have nation specific yeah. decks okay add bonuses maybe to your rally checks or you know leaders things like that so that's the tricorn system it adds those basically three things if you have the american revolution game I mean, I put the rule book side by side this week to see what the differences were. Identical text. So, I mean, it's nice. I wish I would have just put a star by what was unique, which is one section for um, chieftains. So, I mean, it's there, but it's not the same game because this is really strength versus strength. The I've been calling them Jacobites. Jacobites? You're probably I've, right. I've heard Jacobites. Yeah. Okay. You're, you're, you're right. Those dudes. And I'm going to be talking about Jacobites later. So. Okay. Those dudes are really fierce on the Highland Charge. They get up in your face. They're nasty in melee where the government side was more into the linear discipline. So it's your strength versus strength. So it's, I mean, they're very different in the two sides where the American revolution is a little bit more, I have elite, I mean, I have regulars, you have regulars, we have lights, you have lights type of thing. Um, so yes, the whole feel of the game is different. So if you say, but I have, um, the opposite question, the previous one. I already have Hold the Line, Frederick's War with the Highland Charge expansion. Do I need this? You that need had, more. That had four, same thing. Different style. This is more complicated. That had four scenarios. This has 13. Um, get them both. Um, and now, as far as the cost, I've heard, I see people go, I don't know, I'm not paying $99 for this game. I can get Napoleonics for... What if they got cash? I know, exactly. Now, here's the thing, my, my chillings, I'm going to teach you this. When, do not, when you go to Compass website to buy, wait till the holiday sale, which is going on right now for like three months. Now, this right game, now could mean a year from now. Just get that so thing edited. Know. <laughs> yeah, we're in October. <laughs> Middle of October here. Watch, October yeah. 15th through the end of the year. Get this out thing by this. Um, so yeah, the game normally they sell on their site for 99 during the holiday sale, 64. So yeah, check when you want to buy the Compass Games on their website, wait for that sale. They're very reasonable wow, then. They're not going to like you. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, otherwise people gripe. I mean, if you look at my review on the American Revolution, you saw guys gripe it. I'm not paying 110. I can get this for Napoleonics. And I said, why don't you go to NWS and buy it for 65, which I know they're, they're no longer around. <laughs> so Compass is going to come with some cash, give it to you, right. and yeah. he's going to be cut out. That's right. Yeah. That's but right. I require a minimum. I mean, I mentioned the whole get it during the holiday <laughs> sale. This game is not that high. But. So we're going to... We're going to have to change the name to two thirds as right. much. Yeah. Twice as good. That's right. <laughs> and cash. So, anyways, that was my number four Command and Color Strikehorn Jacobite Rising. Ready for three? Ready. Ready for three. My That's number three minutes. is Aircourt Battalion Combat Series by MMP. Uh, the designers are Dean Essig, the king of gamers, and uh, Carl Flung came out in 2022. The Battalion Combat Series is, uh, this is the smallest one. It's a one map, uh, so it's good for learning the system. And I really enjoyed learning the system because the thing it does that's unique is it takes the different kinds of combat. Movement is, is pretty standard, but you've got uh, infantry attacks. You've got uh, shock combat by... Uh, Armor, you've got engagements between armor, you've got barrages for to destroy things, barrages to suppress things, you've got an attack by fire when armor vehicles are coming up against infantry. And what you have to learn in this game is how to integrate all of those attacks to, to achieve your, uh, your objective. And you're just activating one unit at a time. It might be, you know, this uh, conf group, for instance, or, or this 
uh, regiment. You know, a, a, you're just activating a few of your units, and then that goes back and forth, or it can be done randomly. It's, you know, the basic design is you go back and forth, but you're only activating part of your forces. So um, I like it a lot. This is the only one I've got in the system so far, but I am thinking of getting, uh, I'm limiting my new purchases to games that fit my larger table. Uh, so I'm, I'm thinking of expanding, but right now, I mean, I've been enjoying learning the system with, with Aerocourt, the Battalion Combat Series, way easier than the Operational Combat Series, which is good, too. Hmm. And that's my number three for Games of the Pestilence, Aerocourt. Is that more complicated than SES system? <sighs> yes, it is. Okay. Because in SES, it's these units are attacking these units, the zone of control. This is smaller, so it's this tank is attacking this tank and then mm -hmm. can attack this infantry. Okay. So it's more complicated. Hmm. All right, my number three is Assault Red Horizon 41. This is designed in Germany by Wolfgang Klein. Um, Assault is going to be part of his plans. Um, multiple games like in the genre, this one being Red Horizon 41, is Barbarossa as it kicks off. This is tactical. So um, Wolfgang reached out and said, you know, I've seen a couple of your videos. You love tactical. Would you like to try the system? I said, yep, uh, please send it on over. The, the, the kind of the hook is very nice dice. Think these engraved dice from Fantasy Flight and cards for your particular kinds of units that will tell you short range. Um, you will roll, you know, two red okay. and a yellow. And then your odds to hit are higher on those red dice than they are for um, the yellow or the blue, or is there a green maybe, I can't remember. And then whoever you're attacking will say defense dice that you have, and you, they'll be rolling their dice to try to cancel yours, and it's a simple one for one, and then uh, everything, it's tactical. So um, I thought, oh, this is going to be very, very light, probably one of the lightest tactical games I have, and it'll fit in. And it turned out, no. <laughs> um, I, the system of the cards for recon units and being able to see everything for them and picking the dice, that is all simplified, or for a particular tank, all that's factored in by just grab these dice and roll them. But there was a lot of layered complexity with close combats to the point that I even in my video started to explain it and it was going to be way too long and I was tripping over myself because when I was playing with the close combat rules I went in, I had to keep referring. There's a lot of little detail minutia that's in there, which is good. Uh, role playing, it's called crunch, a little more crunchy. And um, it ended up falling above what um, uh, Conflict of Heroes is for me, where Uwe and that had really kind of smoothed out a lot of, you know, it was abstracted. Whereas here, the cards grab the dice, but there was still a lot of different, um, except for this rule, except for that rule, except for this rule, and um, brought up that complexity for me. Now, something that was interesting, and I even wanted to ask you about it, in this game, your your tank or your unit, your tank is down the vertus, right on the line, not on a hex, you know, not on the... You're not on the flat side, you're right pointing... Okay. to the vertus there. Right. And that gives you the front, the rear, because now it's two to the front, two to the rear, one right. to the side. Right. My brain, I think I played one game like that years and years ago, maybe even back in the 80s, or, and I have such a hard time not... Oh, really? Playing. I know this is just me. But I kept looking at it, and I know why it makes a nice, clean side oh, flank hit. Yeah. yeah, you know, flank hit, rear hit. Um, but are there a lot of games? Mm -hmm. that... Richard Berg loved it. Okay, so Berg loved ASL. Okay, ASL. So ASL Berg. goes to the Berg? Points yeah. to... Really? Wow. So that's yeah, okay. maybe why I was thinking. I didn't... I and I'd, <laughs> I'd asked Wolfgang, um, you know, I said, you know, what surprised me was with these nice engraved dice, I, in my mind, I pictured a very light system and I, I found it what I'm no, you know, I've only played ASL at one time. You walked me through very limited. 
Uh, right, so it's not nearly, only. yes, it's right. not nearly the complexity of that, but it was definitely above Conflict of Heroes. And he said we were trying to be below ASL and above Conflict of Heroes. So I'm just curious. So yes. you'll have you'll be pointing at a vertex mm -hmm. in this game. Can the barrel be pointing in a different vertex? Yes, you okay. can. You can have a, a chip Good. that comes on that then shows um, the angle of your turret. So um, and and yeah. So. so all these exceptions you were talking about are the exceptions contained on the cards, or the the exceptions things you have to remember from the rules. Remember. Okay. And that was for me. Okay. For me, I will get. I'll get a little, I'll miss it. I'll miss that rule or, or I'll, I'll be looking and saying, right. now, what do I do? Because there's an exception for close combat, which right. is, which is good. Um, and he actually even had a, uh, there's some helper guides in here, which are good and, uh, some playthroughs and things of okay. that nature. So, um, he is working on, um, having a Western front module and they've already got, um, uh, what's the, it's air power and artillery, off-board artillery is already in the works with okay. uh, with some rules. So, but okay. um, he's got a Sicily version that they're looking at. Okay. He had a great saying, it sounded way better in German. He is the guy that's always throwing the stone further ahead. And I think Eric, one of his buddies, is the one that kind of keeps him grounded on just, we've got to do this first, then this, then this. On those exceptions, if the game catches on, Watch the fans on the BGG files. They will come up with really cool stuff to help you with it. Good I mean, point. They're usually really good at that stuff. I've done a bunch of stuff for Command and Colors games. One of the more interesting things I asked him on a live, because I said, you know, did you print this? I know Germany has a lot of good printers. Did you print it in China? He said, I did. The, the mixing of great dice with good boards with great printing paper, you can't beat the price in China. And there was a, he wouldn't say who, and I wouldn't ask, but there was uh, some some printers in Germany that said part of their mission statement was they wouldn't do war game. So they flat okay. out wouldn't print for okay. war game. Mm -hmm. so, and I was like, hmm. And he was like, understood. Okay. That was my number three. My number three, speaking of games where you point to Vertex and Richard Berg, <laughs> the Men of Iron Tri-Pack. This is three games in one. Uh, they, um, it's, it's Men of Iron, Infidel, and Blood and Roses. Uh, covers medieval battles like Falkirk, things like that. Infidels, the Crusades, and Blood and Roses is the War of the Roses. Um, the This uses Richard Berg's tactical system, which has been variations you see in a lot of games. Simple great battles of history, you see a lot of elements in it. Um, against the Odds put out a couple of them. Kulikovo, the Golden Horde, Suleiman the Magnificent, both by Berg. The Battle of Tours. Um, Sign of the Pagan, Victory Point Games, the Glory series. I didn't think it worked very well there. Frederick Bray took it to the Days of Glory series. Um, so you see that you see it a lot. Uh, characteristics you'll see is your units will be color coded, and you don't activate everybody at once. You pick one and say, "I'm going to activate this group." He calls them battles. With um, and you do that, and then to, you try to continue on. You pick. A, you have to pick a different one, and then roll within that commander's range. Better the commander, the better the range. If you do, you keep going. And if you fail, goes to the other guy, gets a free one, keeps going. So if there's no turns, it's just back and forth the whole time. Hmm. Um, so um, when you go into combat, lots of modifiers. It's very tactical. You're trying to get guys to hit them from multiple directions. There's a combat matrix, heavy unit against a light unit in melee is going to get a good bonus, things like this. But it, really quickly, you catch on to those, those where you're sitting there going, yeah, 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 okay, I got this. But... Um, Anyways, um, and the games are decided by flight points. When units route, it costs you. So something like a mounted man will cost you much more than a low quality unit. And when you hit this threshold, your whole army's basically routed. Um, the favored person in it might have to, let's say, get 60 total flight points, where the one that lost the battle might have to do 40. So his, you know, kind of this attitude of, well, we're just going for historical here. We're not going for balance. You want to balance it, you could bid points Anyway, number number of ways players could try to balance it out. Um, the system solos very well. There's only one hidden thing in there, very minor. These chits, you could do a Stuka Joe or just roll with it. It's pretty easy, but it solos incredibly well. That's what I like. Since it's not really going for balanced, I like to 
play it out, watch the history. And it's really cool because you're thinking, oh, how's this other, how are they ever going to rebound? And all of a sudden they get control and they start getting a few lucky rolls and they start bouncing. You just see this ebb and flow going back. Um, Berg did a lot of these, these lesser known, lesser game topics and they were an intro for me. This was, when I discovered this and I, all these other games I listed, except the Days of Glory series, I really got into them and that was my biggest thrill last year was discovering the series. I went crazy for it, loved playing it, and just watching all the history unfold in it. Hmm. Um, so yeah, um, and the rule book, these are older games. I don't remember, like, well, it's only come out around 2005 or so. And so there's been the errata and blah, blah, blah. They put it together and made an excellent rule book, one of the best I've seen. Common rules amongst all three games, if there's something special to like Infidel, you'll see it colored. It'll say Infidel only, blah, blah, blah. And it's a very, it's also a very intuitive system. So um, the game is available. It's on GMT's website for 95 bucks. I got a P500 for obviously less, but it is out there. And it's an awful lot of game. A lot of scenarios, three games in one. Yeah, when do they do the sale? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know when their P500 is. <laughs> Anyways, that was my number three from the, <laughs> from the Pestilence. So we All right. get there. My number two from the time of the pestilence is Versailles 1919. That is by Jeff GMT by Jeff Eggelstein and somebody named Mark Herman. I think he's that guy from NCIS. I don't know. I don't know. And uh, came out in 2020. <laughs> this is about the uh, post World War One conference where they were trying to settle all of the outstanding issues. What are we going to do with the Middle East? What are we going to do about women's suffrage? What are we going to do about uh, the reparations we want uh, Germany to pay. Well, how, what are we going to do? We've got a problem with Bolshevism uh, growing. Uh, so it's it's a unique system. I mean, there's really nothing like it. You're, you're bidding. You've got a limited number of influence points, and you put them out on issues to to try. You want to be the one that decides the issue. Hmm. Might be worth a different number of victory points. And then you, there will be an effect in the world. Uh, the best example is what are you going to do about the Mideast? Are you going to make it a standalone state? Are you going to make it a protectorate? Are you going to make it um, a mandate? Uh, are you going to have a pan, pan, um, whatever you would call it, pan Mideast confederation of a whole bunch of states? And depending on how you solve it, you know, Britain's going to be upset if you solve it one way, whereas they will be happy if, you know, they become a UK mandate. Mm. But you know, the the Mideast is going to be, is going to have a lot of unrest. It's the happiness of the four participants and the unrest throughout the rest of the world. Um, it plays really well with three or four people. It's, it's, you historically see the issues and what the impact of the issues are. You see the people that visited the uh, Versailles conference, like uh, I knew, but forgot Ho Chi Minh mm -hmm. was actually there looking for a a free United Vietnam and didn't come to pass. Or um, Maynard uh, <coughs> Keynes, the economist, was there. Mm. T.E. Lawrence was there with Prince Faisal. So you see all of those people. The, your military status, how you wind down your military comes into play. The only thing that's bad with this is it's got very deterministic scoring. You, you always know exactly how many points each player has. Uh, so I came up with a variant that just adds a little bit of hidden information based on the same issues that are in play, you know, you, you get, I would get points for um, if you are limiting the, if you make German reparations pay, if they have to pay a lot in reparations, and I might have a little hidden counter that I get an extra point if they do that. I've played, I've developed it, posted it out on Board Game Geek uh, as a variant, and uh, played it, have played it enough that, you know, people say they like it. So hmm. I think that that fixes the only thing <clears throat> wrong with this game is the perfect <clears throat> knowledge. But this is my number two game of the Pestilence, Versailles 1919.
Mm. A number two game of the Pestilence is uh, Phil Eckert's Neanderthal. Oh, so, sorry, I saw something on the side. I was like, oh yeah, I thought that yeah. was the name of your game. I was like, Ooh. nope, Neanderthal. Eklund. Eklund. What did I say? Eckert. Oh, why did I say Eckert? It I is have Eklund. no idea. It's even written as Eklund on here. Yeah. Um, so I picked this up. Um, I first, I think you showed me, and I, I picked up the one, exp the, the the nice version, the the one in Mexico. Perfiriana. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and I've got a few other of his designs, and I thought this would be perfect because I'd read that you can play it with a whole group around, but it solos really well because you're just trying to keep your Neanderthal tribe alive. And it was something that I had the time to just sit down with and kind of play through and, and double check the rules I was going, and then I started to grok it more and more. and. Liz, my wife, said, she came over at one point and said, what are you playing? I said, well, I'm playing the Anatol, Phil Eklund game. And I go, why? She goes, you're talking to yourself a lot over there, real low. And it's a full conversation. I was like, real? And because I'm sitting there thinking, oh, I need to, oh, I need to, now I'm gonna, I need spirit now I'm gonna do this. So then yeah. the next phase, I need right. to do and this. And, and, and I'll have this. And, and if I can learn okay. how to flake, if I can yeah. learn how to flake. You know? There you and, go. Yeah. And it was all, and I was like, wow. And I told her, I think you might like this. And she said, no way. <laughs> <laughs> and... I had it up and I played it. it. It's to the point. It wasn't hard. I think it's like all those games. You got to understand what kind of is moving right. around. Right. It's it's identifying what are the moving parts yes. on those cards. Yes. Yeah. And then once you start to get it, it opens up. And now here's the problem. I haven't played it in a year at least or a year and a half. I'd have to probably go back and recreate that first reading and making sure. And or maybe then, you can get yourself to talk about it. Yes, I could just talk and go through. <laughs> but I, it was so pleasing. It was one of those where his, Phil's games, will, when they just kind of open up for you and you're, mm -hmm. you're in that world, it's just so kind of rewarding as you're able to trigger things and get a card to do what you wanted it to do and and a few playthroughs to get it to happen and uh it was it was very nice when everything had kind of slowed down with the pestilence and i was just had this out playing trying to keep the neanderthals alive which we know yep. they didn't yep. <laughs> so um a small little box with tons and tons of gameplay packed into these cards Typical Phil Eklund. But didn't I just see something recently that they have found like some some Neanderthal gene in in some you know it's it's like it's still around. Well, I know like I did the That's twenty twenty one you know the twenty <laughs> twenty three and me twenty one and me I, I I did the genetic test and I have like a very small percentage of Neanderthal. So okay, but so. Phil Eklund's right. Neanderthal. All right. We're good. Okay. My number uh, two, yeah, from the Pestilence is The First Jihad by White Dog Games. Solo game by Ben Madison and Wes Ernie. They are a phenomenal design team on solo games. You might have seen Mound Builders. I think they did Gorbachev mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. um, it covers the Umayyad Caliphate between 632 and 750 AD. You know what the Umayyad Caliphate is? No. Because I did not. These dudes basically started in like around um, Saudi Arabia, and in that time, they they become the eighth biggest empire in history by land area. Hmm. They were twice the size of the Roman Empire. Um, this is covering that the Umayyad dynasty. Um, so what the game is not is it's not one religion against another. You are the underdog in solo game you're the underdog so you're everybody else because this is their expansion uh, you're covering armies from byzantium persia visigoths nubians khazars armenians chinese indian states and others so it's a it's a lot of religions um, the game is best described as an inside out state of siege game but i want to explain that because that creates a lot of good or bad in your head automatically simple game tower defense, a lot of tracks, cards till you move guys in, you try to roll them back. That is not what this is. They start in the middle. The cards say each one of these tracks where you have armies takes so many hit points and you have to absorb them through retreats, 
uh, flipping them to their disorganized side, uh, holding up in a castle for a siege, things like this, and you get knocked back. Your action points are spent trying to repair and conquer back forwards. And at the end of the turn, if where they start at, if there's space between you and your army, they are going to try to convert that next area. Basically, their armies are out there. Now they're going for religious conversion. There's a die roll they got to hit. And if they do, it shows the extent of their empires, like a little Islam marker that they are spreading out. Now you can push back and try to reconvert, but it's very, very, very difficult to do. And um, at the end of the game, you... Um, it's not like an auto defeat hit the middle. It's you are continually getting pushed outwards. At the end of the game, when the deck is done, you sum up the points for how far they expanded, and then you compare to the list to see how you did. Um, it is not a light game. It's not a short game either. Um, it took. It takes me. There's a basic and advanced. Um, takes me about three hours or more to play the mm. basic game. Takes Wes wow. Ernie the designer about four hours to play the advance and he knows the rules inside out um the nice thing about i i've only played the basic i said i had the advance set up this year had some things go sideways and i had to pull it down and then i played the played it again at bardius con the light and this was my game of the year last year and nothing changed my mind that it's that good um now it is while i said it's a long game the nice thing is it's a really easy game that you play a card you do all your stuff and then, oh, I'm going to go watch the football game and come back in three hours. You have no problem picking it up. Um, I'm going to fly out of town for a couple of days. You come back, you have no problem picking the game right back up. You're not like, you know, oh, I got to remember to do this and do this. So it's a great, it's very easy to do that. So unlike a lot of games. Um, now, I'm going to talk about the elephant in the room because you really can't without this game. If you go to it, there's a lot of people that rated it one for a game for reasons that are, have nothing to do with the game. There's people who rated a 10 to fight the people who rated with ones and call them names. <laughs> Anyways. Um, if it doesn't, can you give us a hint of if it well, yeah. what was not, I mean, do they I'll tell just you. like the gamer, the, the designers? Or? Yeah, yeah, the, uh, the, the game, the, there's a bloody history involved. And Ben Madison has very strong opinions in his designer notes. If you saw my review of his American Revolution game, Don't Tread on Me, I harped on his designer notes had two errors. His opinion was just factually wrong. Um, so he has very strong opinions that can rub people the wrong way. Um, there's also on, an are event. we talk about Phil? No. <laughs> no. But um, there, is, um, there is an event in the game that flips all the markers at the extent, the Islam markers, and there's always names on these. And let's just say if I was the designer, I would have named it something else. It's a play on words, it's sophomoric humor, and it's disrespectful. Every time I look at it, I'm like, oh, seriously, dude? But anyways, um, so as far as would you want to get this game, if the topic, if this is something that's sensitive to you, you may want to think about not getting the game or at least doing some research. Um, me, you know, like I, I don't have a problem playing Mound Builders. It has a lot of religion in it. 80, 30 is one of my favorites. I don't have a problem playing a game on the Crusades. That's just me. I have a problem playing B-29, Bombers, Rife, Firebomb populations. So it's really what kind of gamer are you? If that's something that's sensitive to you, you might want to what? You may want to take a pass. If not, it's a fabulous game. Um, when you, if you do get it, please don't engage in all that silly BGG drama. And I'm going to run around and give all his games a one and teach him a lesson. Didn't you play Nuclear War at a party yeah. once? Oh, I love that. That, that game's <laughs> dark humor. That game's bizarre. Got it. Okay. I'm it's just, not even close to I being had a realistic. distant memory. My wife asked me the same question. Would you like Nuclear War? Yeah. I'm like, dude, it's, yeah, not, you, you it's not historical. It's goofy. The quote was, you love Nuclear War. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, nuclear, the game is available. Nuclear. 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 The game is um, on White Dog Games' website, 56 bucks. Um, so that is my number two game during the Pestilence, the first year. There's no fighting in the war room. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so my number one. But before I go to that, I had to give three quick honorable mentions. Okay. Because there were, you know, there were a lot of games new to me in COVID. Number one, Bayonets and Tomahawks by GMT. I forgot mm -hmm. to write down then. By GMT. Mark Rodriguez came out in 2021. A distilled good uh, riff on the French and Indian War. You still have different types of troops. You still have the you know Indian raids. You still have uh, combat, uh, regular troops versus provincial type troops. 
it, it, I really enjoyed it as a new spin on the French and Indian War. Number two is Unforgiven. It's about the trial of Mary Surratt for the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. It's kind of it's a reverse tableau. It's a tableau destroyer like Seven Wonders Duel. You start with the cards. I can do this card. Oh, this card is, you know, I can do this one card. You're trying to gather evidence. You're trying to get eyewitness testimony. You're trying to sway judges. The reason it uh, get, gives me an honorable mention is it restored some faith in Kickstarter. It was a, All of my previous Kickstarter experiences have been bad. That was a good Kickstarter experience. And third, the game that I've played a lot and borders on being a war game is Dune Imperium. It's a worker placement game on the Dune universe licensed out of last year's Dune movie. You've got the characters on the cards. I mean, it's uh, Timothy Chalamet, it's Jason Momoa, it's Josh Brolin. But half of the game is trying to get uh, influence and alliances with factions like the Fremen, the Desert Dwellers, the Spacing Guild who are hauling the spice around everywhere, the Emperor. But half of the game is gathering up the forces, sending them out to fight on the surface of Dune. Half of your victory points are going to come from that activity. And I've played that game a lot. That's designed by uh, Paul Denon. And it came out in 2020. So those, those games were in the running. But my number one is Imperial Struggle by GMT. Mm. This is designed by Ananda Gupta and Jason Matthews, the same guys that did Twilight Struggle which stayed number one. I believe it was the yeah. number one game on Board Game Geek longer than any other game. Yeah. This is about the uh, global rivalry between Britain and France from 1697 to 1789. This is an action selection game. You're going to be picking each turn uh, to do actions either politically, economically, or militarily. And, you know, as you pick one, there are fewer actions to choose from. The thing is, it's, it's a brain burner because you've only got four impulses a turn, but you've got eight things you've got to affect hmm. every turn. With the, the situation, who dominates in Europe, India, the Caribbean, and North America, who has the most prestige in Europe, which is something else, who has... Uh, three, the, you can, you dominate commodities, things like uh, cotton and spice and fish and furs that change every turn. So, you know, you can't just totally commit to, I'm going to dominate fur market because next turn it might not be worth anything. So, uh, plus every turn you've got to prepare because at the end of most turns, you're going to fight a war that will take place throughout the world. Mm -hmm. You know, it'll, it might, you might fight the Carnatic War in India, and the Jacobite Rebellion will be one of the theaters in the conflict between Britain and Europe. So you, you know, limited time to impact a lot of things, and there's virtually nothing random in this game. Mm -hmm. There's no rolling dice to see who does kind of the only thing random is which tiles you start the turn with and you get three uh, event cards which you may or may not be able to play. So this is my number one game. Imperial Struggle uh, from GMT, my number one game during the Pestilence. All right. All right. So before I get to my number one top five game of the Pestilence. Uh, just a quick mention, my honorable mention would be Into the Odd. Um, uh, Chris McDowell. Uh, it's a old school renaissance OSR game. It was originally just a little zine. And uh, Free League out of Sweden did a remastered version, put it with a nice ribbon and a nice hardbound book. Um, so uh, great game. It's got me interested in all these OSR games that are out there, which are just... What is OSR? Um, uh, old School Renaissance is basically D&D &D rather than Advanced D&D. &D. 
Um, I think it's almost like if someone preferred to play squad leader instead of Got it. Uh, advanced squad okay. leader. So it's kind of that thing. But my number one is also a role-playing game, Twilight 2000 4th Edition. Um, what was interesting here, also from Free League, was that I played the first edition back in the 80s. It's uh, The whole idea was there was war in Poland, and it ends up going tactically nuclear there, and then nuclear worldwide, and you're um, some type of troop. You could be Russian, American, NATO, and you're stuck in Poland, and then it's a um, just a exploration adventure what do you want to do um, and when they made the fourth edition I backed it um, uh, Kickstarter and I kind of got it just from um, you know fond memories of, of playing as a kid but my son with all these board games I have leans toward role-playing games and we've been playing with fate the fate core system and I picked this up and I ended up using it. Some of you may have seen it on the channel. I was able to play um, uh, with Dan Pancaldi and, and uh, Ron uh, from Ohio, Ron Nicholson. So we played that way and I was able to put them out. And then I started doing a solo run through using the Mythic emulator and it worked perfect. And man, man am I falling deep into role playing like it was back in the 80s. So I'm really enjoying it. Twilight 2000 is role-playing in a militaristic world. And this game in particular uses a hex crawl system. So it's the sandbox <clears throat> wide open. Where are we going? What's going to happen? <clears throat> There's some cards that can flip and cause random events. I've already backed their urban ops, which uh, brings in one of the old modules and amplifies it, Warsaw, things of this nature. So um, it's crunchy and role-playing. There's a lot of, you know, count the ammo. Do you have enough fuel for your vehicle? You're going to have to distill the alcohol, wood-burning stove, all this kind of stuff. So Twilight 2000, my number one game that I've played during the Pestilence. Okay. Before I get to my number one, I was going to explain something because it'll be in the comment section if I don't. I said the pestilence hit home with me in March, so I made my dividing line March. Because um, I'll get, where was this game? Where was this game? France 1944, Return of the Rock Corregidor, and Dungeon Degeneres. People that know me will say, where's those? I played them all in January that year, mm -hmm. so they didn't wow. qualify. They're out. Okay. Um, so, yeah, especially France 1944, since I was so tied in. But the second it came in, I had a plan that day. Okay, um, my honorable mentions are, I have three of them, um, Malta Besieged, the reprinting that Worthington did, uh, Terminator Genesis Rise of the Resistance, wow. very cool Ameritrashy game. Mm. I never saw the movie, but it doesn't matter because you're in the future battling Terminators, and that's awesome. Time travel. Yeah, and the great battles of his uh, great battles of Julius Caesar. Um, so the, that big monster package. Yeah, I haven't worked through it all yet, but and also right yeah. now I'm on Simple System, so okay. I haven't explored all that okay. it has to offer yet. Mm. So probably would be much higher once I get there. But okay, so my number one game is. Cthulhu Death May Die. It's by Come On. I've never heard of them, but they Simon. They're by they're a subdivision of Asmodi or whatever you call them. Well, now they are. They yeah. used to be cool minis or not. That oh. was literally a painting website, and then they decided to start producing games with minis. And Simon was born. This is design. I'm probably saying his name wrong. Rob Devia Devia. Deviao. Yeah, he's like an Ameritrash legend. Mm -hmm. And Eric Lang, who I see his name on BGG all the time for a bunch of other games. Yeah. Um, it is a cooperative game, and it is, in my opinion, the ultimate Cthulhu game. I've played Arkham Horror, I've played Old Shore, <laughs> I've even played Call of Cthulhu, I mean, the, the Pandemic, pandemic Cthulhu. version. That's a I good do. game. Yeah, that is good. But this Scary. sits all alone on top of Mount Olympus. <laughs> this is the best Ameritrash game I've ever played. Better than War of the Ring, better than. Um, claustrophobia better than nexus ops um you if you have played a cthulhu game you notice you know you're going around whether it's around the world in eldritch horror or around the city in arkham horror getting clues shutting gates things like that trying to stop the elder one from coming through and, and if he does you can fight him but you're going to lose um this one it's too late you're in the end game you are in a building 
uh, the bad dude is coming. This has Cthulhu and Haster in it. Um, who, whichever one you're playing. Bad dude. Yeah. I the elder you were going to say show enough. Yeah. <laughs> show, show enough is the hero show of that enough. movie. <laughs> um, no, but um, yeah, it is too late. The cultists are in there doing the the final um, the the final ritual to bring them forth. You've got to disrupt the ritual when you do. Cthulhu, whoever is going to come in there, and you got to kill him. Um, you're not looking for clues. You're trying to disrupt a ritual and do a lot of fighting. And it's like I said, it's all in one building. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, each character in this, I mean, the way, you, the way you live, I mean, the way you win is you kill the bad guy. If you take, if your characters all go insane or if they all die, you don't, or you don't disrupt the ritual or it takes you too long to kill Cthulhu or whoever you're fighting, you lose. Um, so it's just down and dirty and lots of combat. It does help to have a war gamers mentality because you have a lot of tactical thinking in this. Um, you have a character card, each with three unique skills um, from, a, from a whole menu. I mean, it's on there already. It might be things like you fight better melee, you fight better distance, you heal faster. Um, my, one of my favorites is Rasputin's a character in there. He gets an extra life because um, he dies and comes back, you know, it's like a video game. Um, you have an insanity track, because when you're rolling for hits, there's also insanity, because you can't have one of these games without an insanity thing going on. That's the same. Yeah. As you go more insane, you hit certain thresholds, and when you hit the threshold, it'll trigger your character flaw. There's this whole deck of cards, and you draw one randomly. It could be kleptomaniac. I'm going to steal one of your things. I believe it. Or I'm a pyromaniac. I'm setting another fire marker in our area. <laughs> all kinds of... I get on the ground and cower, and they can't hit me, but I have to waste actions getting up. I mean, just all kinds of crazy different things with these. Um, but at the same time, when you hit that threshold, you power up. You pick one of your three skills and move it up and get something else. So in case of Rasputin, if you keep powering them up, you can get three bonus lives. Or you might get, if you got the melee skill, you might get extra dice in melee. Um, because as your character gets more insane, they become more focused. But if you go over the top, boom, you, you're insane beyond, you're out. You've gone over the edge. So um, that is the cool feature that as you go crazier, you get tougher. Um, it's true. Yes. This game has two elder ones in there, Cthulhu and Haster. If you want more... You can get Yog Sagoth. Wow. And when I was on last night on the website, I finally found it. The black, uh, the black goat of the woods. He's been very hard for me to find, so I got him on the website. Well, you're dropping some Venmo money. Ah, yeah. <laughs> um, so each one of these bad guys has obviously the bad guy dude in it, and his powers, and they're very tough. They're killable, but they're tough. And um, he'll have his own special henchman, super nasty bad guys, and he'll have his mythos cards. This game also has six scenarios. They call them episodes, little boxes. They have their mythos cards. So you shuffle them and it creates variable mythos between which episode, which bad guy you're picking, and which common bad guys that scenario uses. Um, because there's also more common beds. Um, so, so you get an awful lot of variability in this one box. If that's not enough, you can get the expansion. Six more of them, more bad guys. More heroes. Are you playing alone? Or you can you... solo. Well, it's a cooperative, so you can right. solo it. What are you doing? Um, Aaron and I have played seven okay, times this year. Okay. Um, I taught my daughter. She loves it. We've played twice. I've played this solo. Hmm. Um, so um, this is available on their website. I'll warn you, it's expensive. It's 109 bucks. Seven, uh, when, 75. 109? 109. Oh, I thought you said 109. No. So that's what I thought I heard. 109, 75. These are 24. Uh, it's, it can be a money pit, not as bad as some people's Kickstarter money pits, whose names I'm not going to mention. Or ASL. Yeah. Sure. But um, my this advice is, if, if you say, man, that looks really cool, don't go the whole FOMO route and buy everything. Just try the game and see if you like it first. And otherwise, it's FOMO's a lot. Do what it's about two. It's do. about two fifty to get mod I have. I mean, they go crazy. They had a Kickstarter thing where you could get like this giant Rylea or whatever you call that. It's a big giant Cthulhu, and he becomes the game board and stuff. And then they have this. So they had some crazy Kickstarter. I didn't get the Kickstarter, so I missed all that. And if you want that big statue thing, he's like five hundred to a thousand bucks. So you can really go insane with this. Literally, what, just like this game. What What is a player's turn is it uh, moving a piece? I'm uh, moving a piece on the board. Is it playing a card to take it's, an action? It's is three it... actions, and you can do you can move on an action with like three spaces right. unless you're swift. That's right. a special. You get four. Uh, you can fight. Uh, you can rest if there's nobody in your room to heal 
and right. um, you won't heal insanity. Right. But um, and there's also a, a I don't forget what they call it. There's like there's health points. There's like oh. They have something else. It's basically like do over. You can get re rolls. But okay. if you, but if that thing loads up, okay, and, yeah, you can spend you can spend points on that to re roll. But if you're full, sometimes some of the characters you get okay. require you to have a certain number. Um, but every when Aaron and I have played this thing, it's tough, but it rewards good play. Um, I will often take the melee person because I am a Klingon warrior. I love somebody <laughs> like Lizzie Borden. She's a character in here. We get toward the end, we get desperate because you have to. Um, I'll get. I'll go up there and I'll just whack Cthulhu, just and, and die. Um, Is that what you do? Yes, it's what I do. Melee? Yeah. I get in their face, go full Klingon on them, I give my life, and then I tell Aaron, finish him up. Oh. One, one of our games he had at the end, he was going to die on the counterattack if he didn't make it. He had to get eight hits with eight dice. Wow. Aaron is the worst, second worst die roller next he, to Rusty. He Rusty. He got seven. I couldn't oh. believe he rolled them one at a time, and then he hit miss that eighth. And I was like, seriously, dude. But we have often come very. I mean, we've won twice, we've lost seven times, but we're always close. Hmm. So it's it's thrill. I mean, if you some things can go bad. My daughter and I played. We got we got waxed early, hmm. and you know. But if it does reward good play and very, it's very. But yeah, it's it's so so thematic. And we like to say it's one of the few games you get to go up and punch Cthulhu in the face. Aaron said he loves the game because it has in the rule book, you might be on fire. You have to make a roll to see if you're on fire when you leave a room. And he just, that makes me as his own. Yeah. Cthulhu could be considered a dinosaur. He practically is, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, when I tell you, you know, I love Ameritrash Second Award games, and I've hyped up them in the past. So, I said this one, and it's not a cult of the new. I've played it nine times. I've been playing it since December. And I just can't yeah, get enough. And I was like, about it. yeah, I was like, this is the best Ameritrash game I've ever played. My number one from the Pestilence, Cthulhu. Death so have you done anything uh, Lovecraftian then during the Pestilence? I did, actually. I, yeah, uh, so did I. Yeah, what's I, yours? I picked up the, um, oh shoot, what's the little, the card game? Living card game? Yes. Yeah, I picked that up. And I've been playing the living card game online. There you with go. With some people. I almost and wish I'd done it online. It, it's uh, it's a we've been doing it on tabletop simulator, hmm. so it, it works. Yeah, you know, hmm. all of those things, Vassal, Vassal, table. I what I, the conclusion I've come to is they are none of them are intuitive. You can't you can't sit there by yourself and figure out how to how to play a whole game. Hmm. You know where this in this one you draw a card by clicking this button in this one. You hover over it and type a number. In this one, you you click and drag these over. You know you can't guess how it's designed. If you know somebody that knows the system, or you and a couple people work together, you can figure it out, and then it's a whole new world. Hmm. So that's that's great. But then I've also been listening to uh, Lovecraft when I've been uh, working out at the Y. Oh, really? Yeah, so so it's like you know I'll listen to uh, space, color out of space, and then we'll do the card game. And oh, now I know who this guy is. Yeah. You know, on my my vessel modules that I I've, I only did like one in the last three years, but um, I'd put a little readme in the corner, and it would show walk you through. You want to do this? Right click. These are your options on the unit. On um, France, nineteen forty four. I have a, you click it and Obi Wan Kenobi walks you through how to how to play the game. It's like just a scenario, just Nix. It's like a vassal, a, a log file. Just I put my name as Obi Wan Kenobi, and I was like Nix, Nix. You know, just go through and it shows you how to do it all. What drives me crazy is I put these out and people are like, well, how do I do this? And I'm like, do we not know what read me means? It says right there on the thing, huge letters, read me. And I even said there, please hit the read me. It'll walk you through how to do my thing. <laughs> but, that's been so long doing those things. Because because a lot of times, uh, the counter the counterpoint is, they don't need when you do a readme, you include all of the things people would want to know. Mm -hmm. Sometimes all people want to know is number twenty two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and so you're having to read through, read me twenty one times before you get to the one thing you need to know. I tried to set up a little menu where it had like combat, this cards so it, it broke it into topics for you but and i tried to and if i get too big it's 
it's, it's a pain for sure. editing, but yeah, I tried okay. to chop it down. Right. But yeah. Every once in a while, someone will comment on like a show that came out five years ago and say, "Hey, how does this type of something combat work?" And I'm like, "Oh, I don't, I don't remember. Yeah, I don't remember at this point in time, unless it's something I played so much of." So yeah, when I did the France 1944, that's where I first came up with the idea of well, just making a whole of 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 making the whole log file that just walks you through nice. it and That's from the beginning idea. to how to do it so but some people put a lot more stuff into it than other people on how much how well, it's a pleasure right. to have us all here yeah right. and uh thank Thanks you to join us viewers. yeah hope Hampton. you enjoyed it as much as we did Woo, we're out of here bye-bye bye, -bye. bye. All right.